Okay, so thanks guys. Um, before we talk about mobile, just another um, announcement here. So, um, as you know, we're getting closer to the bachelor and master end, uh, you know, uh, season end, if you like, the semester, right? Usually in the last semester, uh, students work in the bachelor's and master's, and you will be in that role as well in a year or so. How many of you are actually doing bachelor's already? All right, you guys will be out of this role in a year. Very good. But perhaps you may be in a master situation there. Who knows? Um, but either way, so you kind of can empathize at least on you. Yep. Is it no, a you're not. No. High quality VR headset because uh, my glasses means that uh, low quality headsets are not good. Wife, HTC wife. Okay, that's good. Right. So um, that's what 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 is involved there. So and here is um, one experience. I'll. Uh, I link that um, 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 slide to the uh, wiki so you can actually recover it and click the link if you want to. So there's a uh, um, bit of an experiment that explores, um, yeah, actually uh, redirected walking. Who knows what that is? Redirected walking? Walking? Yep. Cool. What is it? Yeah, it's a technique in VR to kind of work around the, the fact that you have a very small space. Yeah. You just kind of mess with the scenery and you know maybe if you turn x degrees that way and you turn half x degrees back and back exactly try and turn the player back to the central exactly right so it's a it's a, a quite hot area in, in terms of you know basically uh, giving you illusion of unlimited play field uh, play, playing space right so and there's some research that uh, andreas wang is doing on this one for his masters and he's using for participants to actually figure out how you know how what you can do right to give this and provide humans with that illusion so and as part of this uh, you get your quick lunch but also of course you're immersed into a game situation in vr for roughly half an hour or i guess 20 minutes to half an hour and um, um show you know what 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 your impressions are of that uh, game so it's a good opportunity to participate and actually see what this current state of <coughs> play in this kind of area right now um and it's a really nice experiment actually uh, to participate so if you're keen um, sign, you can sign up using this Google Form thing there, of course. Um, again, I'll post the link, or I'll post that slide, including the link, of course, um, in the um, GitLab Week, and I encourage you to participate. Perhaps I'll just raise an issue on that one as well, so it's easier for you to click. Uh, but it would be good if they get some uh, participants, right? So, um, but that's basically the idea that you are in an institution where you're not only, there's not only teaching, but also research to some extent. And in the future, you may be in the role actually needing someone to participate in your project. So it's really nice if, if some of you would uh, voluntarily pa participate and uh, see what it does, right? And it also perhaps gives you, um, gives you insight into what you um, um, yeah, want to study perhaps next year when you finish your bachelor, right? Or towards master. Cool. Questions? The experiments are next week, by the way. So quite what's soon. The, what's the slide called? Uh, oh, I haven't linked it yet. Oh, okay. I will link it. I will also send then an issue to 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 point to that uh, thing. Sorry for that. Um, yeah. So and, and then you can you sign up. That would be great. But um, yeah, thank you for the interest. Uh, that would be quite an interesting um, experiment, I believe. Okay. So so much about uh, VR in this course. Um, well, we'll probably hear more about it. Um, at, at some stage, I believe we have Richard coming in talking about VR in the context of mobile devices uh, in this course. So, um, recollection. What did we talk about in the past few weeks or sessions? Because I don't know. Please. Testing. Ah, yeah. <coughs> A lot of testing. A lot of testing. Uh, yeah. Different formats to serialize data with. Yeah. That's right. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. That's good. Yeah. We did uh, talk a bit about the sensors at one point, I think. Yeah, at one point. Yeah, Marsh talked about sensors, I believe. I think. Cool. Anything else? Mocking. Ah, there you go. There's some. There's some magic coming up. Okay, mocking. What else? Other forms. What, what did it relate to? Data formats or testing? Testing. Ah, good. What else in testing? UI testing. UI testing. testing. Uh, espresso. Yeah. Espresso, yeah. Briefly. And. Integration system and acceptance testing. Yeah. What? P2 espresso. We talked about 
several different uh, variations of testing. And That's right, a lot of them, right? So acceptance testing, which, which kind of testing approach um, aligns with that? We talked about it last session also a bit. Yeah, that's one. And the other one? The really annoying one? The verification and validation one. Yeah, which, what, what, what kind of testing did we do there? Uh, verification is when you're developing the app. Yeah, or okay. do you mean like Black Box and White Box? No, the, you're on the right track there, but in, in, apart from test-driven development, we have a different and an advanced form from test-driven development, which is really, yeah. Yeah, the behavior driven development. That's right, right? So, d does anyone recall? If you say carefully say no, I'll repeat the entire session. So, it's in your own interest to know as much as possible. That's actually, I will do that next session. I'll ask you stuff you can't answer this, uh, I'll repeat the entire session. I will be brilliant. Anyway, no, please. What's, uh, the, what's the essence about behavior driven testing? That's about writing your tests in a language that's more readable for yep. the client. So, it's given a situation you can assume that and when that happens then this should happen or when that and that happens then this should happen or yeah, yeah and you form your test in that way instead of using assert yeah cool and um, if you use the two v words right now right verification validation right which one does that relate to behavior driven testing is it more which of those v words probably verification because it's about your own implementation of the thing and testing okay Other views? Validation, since you're trying to see if uh, you're building the right product and if, uh, if what you're building is to, uh, going to do what the customer actually wants. So, uh, of course, it has elements of verification in there that you can use it yourself, but it's geared b based on this very descriptive language, right? So, geared towards people that don't have technical background. Right. So that would be more validation. Are you building the right product, right? Doing actually the stuff that the customer wants you to do, as opposed to just, did you do your job correctly? Did you build the product correctly? Meaning, did you get rid of all errors, you know, race conditions, and you know, did you build to the specs? But does it actually mean that it's actually useful in the real world? That's the kind of thing. So that would be, the self-centered one is verification, right? So, and the, the outward looking one would be a bit more like validation and testing it correspondingly, right? Test driven value is more like doing it for yourself, so you have, Consistency, easy regression testing, and maintenance in the future, because you'll be doing it, hopefully. And then uh, behavior-driven testing more like for the acceptance test, right? That's because you mentioned acceptance test, which fits, fits very well. Ideally, behavior-driven tests are part of the acceptance test by the customer. Cool. So yeah, good. So some, some background there, just to bear that in, in mind. <coughs> um, so what else do we talk about? No, that should be it roughly, right, in terms of testing. Um, yeah, just kind of bear that bit of in, uh, in, in, in your mind to some extent. You can try it out uh, in, in mobile exercise if you want, um, but it's, there's kind of a bit of baggage in terms of frameworks that you want, need to be dealing with. Cool. Um, good. Last session, uh, formats. Which formats did we touch upon? Yep. JSON, XML, YAML. Yep. Cool. Any f one of those formats that was new to someone? Still gauging. I've heard about the XML and JSON before. Yeah. Uh, there were a third one that was something in the middle that I hadn't heard of. Yeah, before. yeah, middle, right? So yeah, so it's also quite old actually, but it's 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 kind of increasingly used. You find it more commonly used um, um, for configuration files because of its very lean reading um, and strong um, feature set, uh, relatively. Yeah, cool. That's what we talked about. Uh, what other aspect did we talk about in the context of data formats? Something that could spill over in your practice, apart from the data formats. Good. Okay. I'll repeat the session next week. Um, it's not an empty thread, you know. So, um, no, we talked about benchmarking. Does anyone recall? Yeah, so and what you need to bear in mind when thinking about benchmarking, especially with data formats, but also independently of all of that. What it is you're actually benchmarking, what it is uh, your goal is, because sometimes you want efficiency of the speed, other times you want efficiency of space, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, so you need to know what you're looking for, right? So, and also uh, what does performance mean, right? Is it, for example, transmission performance or is it parsing performance, right? 
serialization, deserialization are usually not don't have the same performance, right? So it may vary. So um, and the other thing I need to you need to know about why why is if some other people did experiments for you, why would it still make sense to repeat do the experiments for yourself again if you have a given project, please? Uh, because of development, technology. Yeah, that's a good point, right? Develop the technology changes, frameworks change, and they that's, can. Yep. That's kind of why they, they, they started the software car company because all the math was so old. And people just used bad arguments and then they redid the calculations. And like, oh yeah. Can right. It's, it can be important to read, read True. Yeah, absolutely. The the progress of technology in itself. You assume that we have about uh, one for one point five percent of the GDP in a country is actually down to technological progress, right? So it's not like people are getting better. It's just that tech moves on. Therefore, the country grows uh, because we use more advanced tech. Anyway, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Your program might use different data, and then they tested with and you know, the different format might be more applicable or the data set might alter the performance as well. That's right, right? So one of the things is there, it's really about know your data basically, right? Because all our data is slightly different, data structure, amount of data, complexity, and so on, right? And it may just may make the difference in which data format you want to use, right? So also want to have extensible, flexible, and so on. So knowing the data, and you can only know that once you build your project, really. So that boils down to, yeah, you kind of need to do the tests every time again, you have a different kind of problem, right? So that's the kind of thing. It's about challenging assumptions. Uh, so not just saying, okay, that's a better format or that's <coughs> inferior. It's, 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 it's a multidimensional problem, right? So linking to your own data, the domain you're applying it in, and the feature set of different data formats you actually want, which of course, formats with richer data uh, features usually imply lower efficiency. I mean, that's uh, quite a natural trade-off that we're dealing with in, in, in IT anyway. Cool. Right, that was the message I want to get across there. Um, cool, any other thoughts? No? Questions from last week? Good. So it was a bit more like, you know, uh, background kind of stuff that, um, that provides you with input in terms of how you can test or develop your projects. Today, I want to be slightly more pragmatic, in fact, much more pragmatic, and just look at, you know, certain features of Android again. So you guys want to go back to that, I guess. Um, yeah, so which is, of course, very specific to Android. So, um, and one of the animations in Android, right? So how can you animate stuff? Because we haven't talked about this yet. Who knows to do, how to do it already based on needs, demands, wishes, or wants? Use like Java effects or something? Again, sorry? Do you use like Java effects? Nope. No, 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 native Android in this case. So we're not, we're not drifting off using other frameworks uh, like Java X, for example. No, 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 it's native Android stuff we're talking about today. Because what would be animations in Android you would imagine? Clicking a button, like scaling it down, for example. Exactly, right? So you want to deal with the, play with the Android elements, the little views, right? So it can be buttons, can be windows, can be, you know, activities you like, right? So of any, any size and shape and so on. And do something to this. What does it, if you say scaling the button, what does it fundamentally do? Show that you pushed it. Yeah. There could be a reaction to pushing, for example, it, sure, but, but how do you, so if you intuitively think, right, so you have the button there, right, so you want to change its aesthetics, right, so somehow, how would you do it without knowing about uh, animations, intuitively? If I gave you that lab right now, okay, make this button larger or whatever else, while it's, while you press, or after you press it, how would you think about doing this? Mm -hmm. With a timer and a property. Very nice. Over time. Perfect, yeah. Google how to first resize the button and then uh, use a view to uh, change it slowly. Right, okay, so that's the pragmatic, um, yes, okay. The pragmatic tutorial center's Android development approach. Yeah, it's probably done in, in practice quite often, in fact. But you're spot on, and fundamentally you would get this answer. What was the answer again? Um, using a timer to keep track of time and then have a property you want to change from a value to another value over a given time. Cool. Did everyone follow? Right, so fundamental easy idea, right? So you take a property of a given object, whatever else, or an instance, right? So you change that property over time. That's an animation done, right? So, and of course, the properties can be very, you mentioned size. What would be other properties you would imagine you to see in a UI? Color. Color, yep, cool. Yeah. So yeah, there you're right, fundamentally right. So, but let's talk a bit about uh, animations, uh, why and what and how you can use them. And uh, let's assume that I can press buttons here. Yeah, I got it. Um, 
So animations are fundamentally about uh, behavior or seemingly uh, um, yeah, sensible behavior, dynamic uh, behavior in your activity, you know, basically why using it. You don't want to reopen the activity with a slightly different layout or whatever else to emulate or simulate behavior. You actually want to have native dynamicity, dynamic or whatever, the dynamic thing anyway, in your activity. So it does something at runtime, right? So something like highlighting, changing color, changing size, uh, yeah, you name it, right? And the fundamental principles, however, are of course borrowed from uh, graphics, right? So you guys, some of you uh, who are participating in graphics prom programming, uh, know about the three fundamental transformations that we do, right? Trans um, translation, rotation, scaling, TRS. And that's the same here as well, right? So fundamentally you would expect that you can scale something, you can translate something, or you can rotate something, right? So, uh, or combine all three of those. The second thing that also relates to uh, animations in Android, um, but it's not called that way, are uh, transitions. That is, animations when you change from one activity to another. Right? How that actually works. Right? Usually you just open another activity on top of another. Right? So you just have this, 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 this uh, 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 one-shot replacement effect that you feel that they're layered over each other. Right? But you don't have like nice transitions like a left, from left to right swipe or something like this right? that you could emulate. Um, and that's, of course, uh, has, has some has some uh, um, appeal as well, right? You can things like fading or sliding between different um, activities, if you like, and uh, have um, a perception of navigation, if you like, right? So if you go to the right, that you feel like you mentally, because our the, the real estate on smartphone is quite limited, right? So you only have a very small screen, so you can't have the same navigational intuitions as you have on a desktop, where you think about, okay, I'm moving to the right, to my right desktop, and doing something there, right? But you can emulate this by using transitions. You give the user a spatial perception of the screen, right? So you basically navigate to the right, right? Then you navigate to the left. Whereas in fact, you're just layering activities on top of each other, inter, uh, mediated via with some sort of transitions in between, right? So there's actually meaning in, the, in a sense that you can make intuitively programs more accessible. You need to test that, of course, with people actually see, does it make navigation easier, for example? But you probably know that, for example, uh, yeah, a classic example would be a, a, the, um, a bank app or something where you have multiple accounts, you swipe to the right and then it moves to the next accounts, right? So some of the apps um, um, have, have that um, as, a, as a convenience way, as opposed to going out uh, one uh, to, the, to the higher level menu and then re uh, selecting from there. Cool. All right, uh, animations, some, uh, yeah, some, 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 point us to some uh, original citations in this area, of course. Um, the key thing is that, of course, you want to have animations that are sensible and actually guide and help you, right? So if they are funny applications that actually uh, distract you and keep you away from actually doing what it's supposed to do, then you most likely should avoid them, right? So, um, and the second thing is, so that's more like when you use them, and here's more like if you make them, how do you make them, right? So. Um, even on the smartphone, uh, when we work with this, we want to use our intuitions as much as possible. Right? And one of our intuitions that is stubbornly entrenched in us is, for example, the laws of physics. Right? So we, we know how gravity works, and if something falls in our app, we kind of expect it to fall the same way as it does in real life. Right? So we expect a third, certain, certain, certain uh, um, um, laws of physics um, in, in, a, in a program uh, to behave quite similar. If you have an acceleration motion, uh, it should feel as if you're throwing something, for example, right, in a natural environment. And the key thing is about for us is that um, we should take away the focus from the animation itself, but rather just make the interaction with this feel natural. And the assumption is then that the, the user um, um, feels that the application is intuitive, right? What's intuition anyway? What, what is intuition? So we sometimes have this thing here. Okay, um, yeah, please. Intuition, it's uh, kind of like part of your subconscious in that uh, it's you see something and you immediately understand how it works or some part of how it works without being explicitly told how it works. Uh, if you have similarities to something you already know, then you expect it to uh, act in a similar way to the thing you compare it to. Perfect, exactly that, right? So it, it builds on prior knowledge and depending on the exposure that we have, right, collectively, but also individually, of how things work, right? So if you get a new smartphone, right, you had a smartphone before, you kind of assume that the new, or expect that the new smartphone behaves similarly. And if it does so, you would say, well, this in, my smartphone is incredibly intuitive to use, right? 
But if you find someone who has never been exposed to a smartphone, give them this thing, they may not find it intuitive at all, right? So it's highly subjective, right? So uh, as you mentioned before, so it's, it's quite important. That's why the point to the laws of physics, because it's something we are intuitively acquainted with, right, and expect. And animation should work the same way. They, they should represent something that makes sense to us uh, and, and guide us and have uh, and usability, right? Utility in a wider sense. So the point is, don't use them if you don't need them, right? So there should not be a blink blink or like the classical blink tag in HTML, right? So do you guys know that, right? I mentioned it before, right? That was part of the early standard of HTML and the, the actual um, um, developer who came up with that tag because it was basically about you can you know embed text in blink text and it would blink constantly. And you think it probably was the <coughs> single worst idea ever doing this thing. And it was in fact so bad it was later banned from HTML, right? So you can't <laughs> can no longer use it. There's still browsers, some browsers that support it, but it's considered a, a nuisance, a distraction. It's like just bad practice in every respect, a blinking tag in your browser. And if you had been a child of the uh, uh, internet user of the 90s, um, you would have seen a lot of web pages with that ugliness, right? Combination of pink, yellow, and blinking was yeah, kind yeah. of pretty much on vogue at that time, uh, you know? So pop-ups and then some blinky, blinky stuff in there. Nowadays, they do it with animated GIFs. Yeah, can't, yeah we can't stop that one. But um, fundamentally, it was built into the code at that time. So really, really evil, right? So uh, a nuisance, if not dangerous. In fact, there were some cases where they uh, claim it had sparked uh, uh, um, epilepsy attack, right? Because of that rapid blinking, please. Can you erase a poke mode episode that, so I'm sure text can do it too. Sure, sure, I can. Um, but it's just interesting where sometimes technology can be misguided as well. It needs to be fixed. So, so, cool. Intuitions, we had this. Navigation, we had this. Ah, yeah, yeah, timing. That's, that's. So, you guys, um, are you cutting videos of anyone? Does anyone of you cut videos? Yes, you do? Yes? Cut videos? Yeah. Do you mean edit videos? Yes, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, uh, edit videos. Yes, I have done that a few times. I have a YouTube channel, I think it's Instagram. Good, so if you're editing videos and uh, you see a person exposed to technology, right, so to a new video cutting tool, especially it's non-linear and allows you to introduce effects and so on, what do you usually see? Confused person. Mm, yeah, no, in the, as a result of the interaction with the, uh, so as the output, not, not doing the interaction. What comes out of those uh, uh, video cutting exercises usually? They don't know how it was done. Complete overkill in terms of effects. Completely overkill, right? So you have massively extended transitions and trying all the different interactions you can probably do, like those where the image emerges out of the heart or shapes into a ball and flies away or a very slow curtain that moves to the left. Right. All that kind of nightmare, right, which is considered really bad practice, similar to uh, animated PowerPoints as well. They were really hot in the beginning. Nowadays, you scarcely use it. I use them sometimes to build up the narrative, but not, not for anything else, right? So we're super hot at that given time. Um, and that's that's the timing thing, right? Avoid the users, avoid wasting the users' time. It needs to be a helpful, not a nuisance, right? So that's the kind of thing. But you're spot on. Yeah, that's exactly. Cool. All right. So that's what good animations do. So if you use them, use them sparingly. Think about users' time. Think about intuitions, uh, laws of physics, and use them where actually help, right? Not necessarily just for the sake of using them, unless of course we specify in an, uh, in an assignment. You say you're supposed to use animations, otherwise you will not get your full points then you're of course a bit screwed, but we probably won't do that really. But you, I think what nevertheless, as technologists, you kind of want to play around with this to get a feel of how it works if you need to lose it, right? So and that's what we're talking about. So in Android, we have this thing. Uh, we have multiple different types of animations, it's quite straightforward. And the simplest and oldest form of them are called view animations. Um, and they pretty much work on any view object, right? So. Uh, they have a set of features that for allowing um, um, you know rotation scaling transparency variation of timing repeating um, animations right so you can you yeah, can have a repeated movement that you want to represent for example and it's quite easily available in um, in the in the tool set so um, I think I have a simple this is kind of empty projects and we we're probably going to fill that with some meaning eventually. Just me, let me just bring up my devices. I'm sure I've done that before. But anyway, let's just skim through the. So, what is that project about? The project is quite simple, straightforward. You have a main activity for now, never a second activity. We get to that. 
So the main activity uh, basically consists of um, yeah, be a witness of my design powers um, of buttons eventually. Right, there I'll see my buttons, right? So a bit of mucking around, they're not quite well oriented. Doesn't really matter. Four buttons, we can play with this. We can reference them button zero, one, two, three. So my code is cleaner than my design, that's good. And then um, what happens is, well, upon click on to any of those buttons, we're basically just calling the method start animation with that view as a property, right? The corresponding view. Recall that buttons are views as well, right? So in the UI, everything is kind of view, buttons are included, meaning they share the, property of the, um, the properties of the view class, which is quite helpful. All right, so if we now have a, um, um, simple animation. Uh, I need to write a bit of a switch statement, otherwise we'll... Um, well actually, it doesn't matter. We can just do it on all of them. What you can do to, for, to quickly uh, get a view, you, you just call view animate, and that's basically it. And then you have the API for, well, doing stuff, I guess, right? So, um, for example, we can just rotate the button, the view, whatever is pressed by 45 degrees. Um, then it's a bit like you may need to manage the state and uh, internally so it's a bit of like a state machine. You set the duration of that um, um, animation, let's say 300 milliseconds, and then you finally decide, yeah, let's just time, after, after parameterizing everything, let's start this thing and see what it, what it hopefully does. Um, Wish me luck. So there's the app. It looks a tad better in the phone, actually. It's just that there's a dis disconnect between the layout editor here and the phone. Sorry for that. It will be faster once we have uh, the first iteration going. So basically, any button I press should basically activate this behavior, right? I have a transaction, uh, sorry, a translation. I can do it with any button, really. Uh, and what it does basically shifts the button around the x-axis by 45 degrees, right? And doesn't do anything else really. Takes 300 milliseconds for doing that. Quite straightforward, right? So relatively uh, easy stuff you can do. Um, you can also chain that. Um, those, so they build a bit of a DSL around it, which makes it kind of a lot easier basically to um, represent it in a single statement. Quite straightforward. Um, and you can, hang on, not this one, in this case, you animate. Um, let's do some translation along the x axis. Oh, no, no, hang on. We need to use the other one that's important translate by. Otherwise, you're expecting absolute values, which is not a good idea. In the GUI, as you guys know, it's, you know, shift that by 100 um, pixels and. The nice part is now you can actually also do a Y at the same time, so you can have diagonal movement um, just by chaining those. Um. You're doing Y twice. Yes. Oh, they're doing Y twice. I'm very sorry. I uh, shall fix that. Sorry. Yeah. You, of course, you can do Y twice as well, but that's not the desired effect exactly. So, but so you kind of can chain it, chain it. It makes it quite, quite, quite nice and straightforward. Okay. So it's basically restarting the activity. And if I'm lucky, uh, and I got it somewhat right, yeah, it does something, right? So it uh, shifts the buttons and shift, and, and it kind of uh, does the rotation at the same time. Um, yeah, so it kind of looks uh, synchronized in a way, right? So that's basically roughly what you can do. So what did we, what other um, API functionality did we see? We can do translation. We can set duration, of course, rotation around uh, x axis. Um, we can change the alpha value. Rotation again here, scaling. Um, yeah, and that's roughly it, I guess. You can have an uh, activation uh, a, a listener here, so you can basically run a thread um, prior to the animation, for example, or in association with the button press, you could just run a, um, um, a, a thread to do something. Usually, idea is that you use it for some animation purposes, but that's not explicit. And so on. So you can, yeah. Anyway, so there's quite a bit of function. Well, there is a bit of functionality you can actually perform. Relatively straightforward. I don't think the API will um, be, be too challenging um, to really use. 
he can do it. So that was the old version, right? So just that's why I'm mentioning it here. So if you see view animations, that's the old version. Um, and um, it has since been kind of considered deprecated, especially for newer versions in Android. Um, and because it has, of course, certain limitations. It's a very fixed API, right? very straightforward, and limited functionality. So scaling, rotation, and translation, I guess. A bit of alpha modifications, but not much more than this. It's relatively slow. Of course, that's not particularly a problem with modern devices. Uh, so you can accommodate this. That's not a big deal. Um, but it's constrained in terms of the properties it actually can modify, right? So it can only modify visual pro uh, visible properties, really, right? The ones that are encoded in the anima Animate API. Um, and here comes the shittiest part. Um, actually, if you do a translation of the button, right? You're moving the button to the top right or whatever else. It doesn't actually um, update the interaction coordinates. So actually, if you press the button then in the, in the different location, it actually may still expect the button press in the original location. So it doesn't actually um, reflect this in the logic um, of the interaction with the user. So you kind of need to accommodate this manually, which is like super medieval, and of course, um, doesn't really help you, um, 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 you know, being, having an abstract modeling approach because you constantly need to fix whatever the animation does, especially if it's related to positioning. So it's really inconvenient and a lot of work. Right. Um, Right, so it's de facto kind of deprecated, but there may be reasons for still using it if you're programming against older Android devices or if you're using really simple fun functionality, right? just changing the alpha value, just doing a bit of rotation or whatever else, but the button is fundamentally in the same position. Then you can just use it as a quick way of actually dealing with this, right? So, and again, if you deal with older devices, so it's still worthwhile knowing about it. So that's the first kind of group of animations that you are, that are dealing with. Um, ah, yeah, and <coughs> it, it doesn't use the GPU, for example. Um, so it, 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 because earlier Android phones didn't assume that the phone had a GPU, so it doesn't use the acceleration features, so it's kind of used the CPU. Again, not a big deal nowadays, especially with the animations we're usually doing on those devices. Uh, but of course, if you have a larger number of uh, inter activity that's going on, then it's uh, a bit more, bit more annoying. So what's the modern way? Well, the modern way, and that is taken, uh, to be taken with care because I think it applies since Android for five already, so quite some time back, 2012, 13, so on. Um, it's property animations. And it's precisely what you have outlined before. Well, how do we do animation properly? Well, you have some property, let's say in this, in this representation here, directly taken from the uh, Android documentation, you have some sort of a property here, X, and uh, certain values, right, over time, and basically you keep track of time to see the temporal progression uh, in the value change, right? So you have a value X, and over time, it uh, supposedly is to uh, reach a target value of 40, but um, with some sort of linear increments over a duration of 40 milliseconds, it you know increments the values. And assuming that Android um, represents or um, updates the screen in between, which it does, uh, it will of course just uh, reflect the change property of the view button or whatever else, uh, and in that progression, right? So that's the idea of property animations, um, and they have a certain set of advantages, right? So. It directly works on object properties. Um, it uses Android refle uh, sorry, Java reflection. We talked about <coughs> this in a second. Uh, who knows what Java reflection is anyway already? Sort of. Yeah, what is sort of, please? You use it to kind of get a Cool. Yeah, so it's kind of a form of metaprogramming in a way, right? So that you actually um, give uh, Java at runtime um, reflective capabilities. So suddenly a, um, you write a program that can tell you what fields a given class has, for example, or what functions it has, right? Or what the function signature is, or some, things like this. So it allows you to get information about classes or objects in the widest sense at runtime. So quite, quite neat. And you can use it for, for, um, for anything, um, really. Uh, yeah, any, any, any concept Java knows about because it's uh, reflective, completely reflective. Surprise, surprise, it's called reflection. Um, so uh, we get to that in a second. Apart from this, of course, the um, support for animation is fundamentally the same as with view animations. That is, you know, you have the representation of uh, um, um, duration, time interpolation, um, repetition. What is time interpolation? How long it 
takes to animate it? That's Again, sorry? How long the animation lasts? Mm, that's duration generally. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what is interpolation, time interpolation? Any intuitions? We haven't talked about it at all, so that's why I'm just. Yeah? Like, interpolation is like. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah, um, interpolation is like having two states. Yeah. And then um, gradually, like, sitting of sort of like a math equation to how it would be in between them. Yeah. Yeah. What would be examples of how it could be between them, right? So what, what would be different ways? What, what kind of um, 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 visual effects could you expect from it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Everything moves in animation, right? So, but why do I need perhaps different interpolations? Perhaps. Yeah. If you have, for example, linear element uh, interpolation, the beginning and ending will be very abrupt. It's going to stop instantly. Yeah. So you can apply easing on in, yeah. in like in the beginning or in the end. Or yeah. Change how fast it moves and acceleration. Precisely. Ending. Yeah. So that's precisely what it is. So it uh, correct. So it allows you to moderate, for example, movement. If you want to have it accelerate really fast, right? It's getting faster and faster and faster, or it actually decelerates, right? Or you want to have this avoid this upper bump and ease uh, the entry and exit point. That's right. Uh, exactly that, right? So you can write your own interpolator and plug it in. So being the, the the moving behavior, this function of progression would change. For example, this is linear progression here, right? So what? For example, if you suddenly have an increase, you would have this x value at 30 already, right? So, and you would reach the 40 possibly earlier or have intermediate states in between, right? So where you say, okay, initially it's really, really slow, but then it picks up in performance, right? So that would be the interpolator that you could uh, 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 possibly apply um, uh, in this context. That's right. So, yeah. And the other thing that it's, um, so apart from, so we have repetition, all the other properties, and uh, what it also uh, offers is uh, animator sets. So basically, you can actually, you saw earlier that I kind of need to, you could combine different animations, right? But you kind of need to figure it out yourself, right? So basically, it's a uh, certain timing for, uh, for an animation. And just so by happenstance, since I'm de facto running them at the same time, because while this animation runs, the first one runs, the second one is executed <coughs> as well. So if you get the timing about right, it looks like as if they're running at the same time, right? But there's no explicit way of making this, well, there's no way of making it explicit, right? Saying, okay, those should be run at the same time and now start them, right? Yeah, to, to, to choreograph your animation uh, uh, more richly in terms of properties and so on. So it's quite nice uh, in, in, in the uh, properties, um, property animations, because you can do that there. Um, and of course, using a GPU that was expected. Again, I wouldn't expect too much, at least on the level of what we are doing, probably not too much, but in general, of course, it can ease the load on CPU, therefore extend battery life. That's basically the um, practical um, effect that you get if you're dealing with this. Uko, um, before I go um, yeah, into the internals, do you guys want to have a break first? Yeah, I get a break. 10 minutes? Enough? Okay, 10 minutes then. So 10 past 3.